So now we are on to part four of the linguistic aspect of writing. Chugging right through, there is still so much we could cover about language. Um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on syntax, hopefully, we'll see, for a, for a couple reasons. It's a little more familiar to, to a lot of people. Um, syntax, it, it's just easier to connect with. You've had a lot more, like the word sounds familiar, you understand a little more about some of the pieces. Um, I do have resources on um, structure norms. So I guess we'll see how it turns out, because now that I think about it, there's a bunch of stuff I could cover. It's just whether you want to sit through and enjoy it, or whether you're going to want to take this a piece at a time. We'll see. Here we go. Syntax is how we form phrases and sentences at its basic. A lot of people know syntax because when we talk about things like punctuation norms uh, of standard written English, um, those are the punctuation rules we're given about commas and semicolons and colons and that sort of thing. Um, well, each of those forms of punctuation are really just writing technologies, linguistic writing technologies, that are used to help a writer take in information in bite-sized chunks. Um, when we talk about syntax, we take advantage of those, uh, those technological advancements as well as others like spaces between words, but that's another thing. Um, we'll talk about that with the technological aspect writing. Don't let me distract you. Syntax is about how we form sentences. Um, and I know in connection to this book, like it talks about correct sentences. I still have a problem, a challenge with that. And it's still tied to that big question of what counts as correct based on sociocultural norm um, when it comes to linguistics. So we'll just, to, to avoid that, we are going to say syntax is the principles of forming sentences and phrases, or how we structure things beyond the word uh, level. So the form and structure of a sentence is often governed by um, common patterns, especially if we're trying to put them into a specific language norm. Um, sometimes these are called rules of syntax, but they might indicate word order, sentence organization, the relationship between words or word classes, and other sentence elements. So, even though we talked about that big picture grammar in this particular slide, it doesn't read as well. Um, because a lot, when we get to syntax, we're really starting to get at larger social norms. Um, for instance, if you think of, uh, in, in linguistics, sometimes we talk about different types of sentences and different languages have different common types. So for instance, English tends to be what's called an SVO language. That's a subject, verb, object. It means there's someone who does something or there's a thing who does something um, to something or someone, right? Um, so I push the chair. Um, that is an, an SVO structure. That's really common. Um, in some languages, that's not exactly um, how it goes. In some sentence constructions um, for some languages, for instance, something called reflexive verbs, um, will sometimes invert word order and place a bunch of things before French and Spanish both do this. So it's a little bit of a stretch, but here's kind of how the example might work, just to keep it easy. Uh, so in English, I might tell my wife, I love you. She knows what I mean. She knows I care about her. Um, and she gets the understanding. And it is in the common structure for that phrase, I love you, subject, verb, object. Now, how do we say span how do we say I love you in Spanish? How do we say it? You guys are so sweet. It's te amo. Um, and so and there's an inferred yo at the beginning that no one says because that's how that verb that type of construction works. But yo te amo is essentially if we try to use that Spanish syntactic structure, that kind of common structure, um, this we sometimes that's why we'll see some of this overlap or this disconnect, or um, a lot of times people go, I know how to say the words, I know how to, I know what the words are, but for whatever reason when I go to actually say it, people still don't understand me. Or my instructor writes awkward or awk on my, um, or underlines it and says, you know, revise or something, um, something like that. A lot of times it's because we've been thinking about language at its, at, as the alphabet or as the words and vocabulary lexicon but we haven't been thinking about the way we put words together because that is its own that is a whole other lens into how languages work and how systems of writing work so when we go I love you um, and we use and someone who someone uses the 
the Spanish syntax with the English words, we get the phrase, I, you, love. And so that's kind of how sometimes overlapping syntactic patterns um, can show up. So we draw on the syntax of one language and then the words of another, and sometimes our listeners get confused. Um, and that can work from English to Spanish, English to French, French to English, German to French, how, whatever language combinations you're dealing with. Um, they have their own kind of structures that are common, and you have your unique ways of structuring things. And what you want to do is leverage what you know about your audience's language structuring um, so that you can better uh, get them to understand what you're trying to say. So you can have a clearer uh, construction. So that's why some of the syntactic patterns deal with a lot with social norms um, in this way. I mean, language is very much social, but we're trying to get lenses for analyzing it. So this is one. How do we put words together in phrases so that they make sense? Um, and so, uh, so we want to be aware of these various social norms or these, um, these common patterns of structuring phrases and sentences. Uh, I have had students in the past um, who struggled with this um, and didn't because they weren't connecting the idea that an English subject and verb really need to stay closer together. Um, I had one student who had a sentence and a pattern of making sentences where the verb was at the very beginning of the sentence, but there was all this extra information in the middle and the verb, uh, the subject was, and then the verb would show up on the second line, you know, 10 or 15 words down. And so it became these really hard sentences to read because English readers aren't trained that way, so, and we're, and people generally are lazy, um, don't judge, it's true, think about it. Um, so, uh, when we go to look at a sentence like that and we can't find the verb and we can't find the verb, we lose interest or we get distracted or we get confused and it takes more work to process a sentence like that if we're used to a certain um, some languages have the verb at the very end all the time, and I've had people who speak those languages um, or some forms of those languages, um, I want to say it was a dialect of German, um, but some when they speak those languages, you have to listen and listen and listen for the verb, and those those writers and those speakers or listeners, are, or those readers, are trained in and have more practice with that. So it's a lot easier for them to listen for understanding and wait for it. Um, in the U.S. culture, that language pattern, um, some people might even connect it with the reason why some speakers talk over each other more often is because in English we get the subject and the verb out there really fast and the details we'll, we'll figure out later. Um, you know, it's like I hear the basics in the subject-verb combination, I know where you're going, and then I jump in halfway before you get a chance to really work out the rest of your sentence. So there's kind of an inter interesting um, social, in interesting uh, discourse patterns, interesting speech patterns that can happen as we think about structure. Um, so yeah, uh, other things that when we're trying to pair this with norms and start blending with the sociocultural, um, we might start shifting to uh, semantics and pragmatics as we think about these different patterns. Um, but suffice to say, when we talk about syntax, we're talking about how phrases are structured and sentences are built. Um, it, we, for instance, when uh, and it could be uh, introductory, it could be punctuation norms, semicolons, periods, uh, anything that indicates a pause or a break in the text or in the in the initial phrase or a, as we're developing units of phrase meaning, sentence meaning, um, dependent clauses, independent clauses, all those things have to do with syntax. And so some of that, much of that is what people are taught from like sixth grade on, at least in the American, in the US K through 12 system. Uh, one thing that kind of native speaker, that people who grow up speaking English um, or have English as a primary language, sometimes they're less aware of, but that international students or second language students or multilingual students have to become more aware of is our social norms connected to the structure of a sentence um, like adjectival order, like the order of adjectives we, um, we think about. There are some really good videos on YouTube. You can just Google adjectival people have taught about it already, but it's, it's kind of a fun thing to think about in uh, in the sense that we often don't think about it. And so then becoming more aware of that pattern makes us more aware of other patterns. Um, so how we order things, um, number, uh, quantity, quality, size, age, shape, color. There's a reason we say uh, big red barn and not red big barn. Um, we usually, um, big two-year-old red barn versus two-year-old red big barn. Like, 
start mixing up that order. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, it can be a really interesting thing, and some creative writers will actually use things like adjective order and doing it against a norm um, as a way to draw emphasis to some part of that, or um, as a rhetorical and rhetorically intentional choice in, in, in some other type of writing. Um, a writer may choose to put the most important adjective <coughs> or the thing they're trying to emphasize. I just dabbed while coughing, for the record. Um, Sorry. Uh, so they'll put the most important thing closest to the verb, and so or the the thing they're describing. So whether it's an adverb or adjective, um, with adjective order, it would obviously be closer to a noun, not a verb. Sorry. Um, so sometimes writers will intentionally break those norms, and because they want to accomplish a different rhetorical purpose and draw focus to a different part of that sentence, um, then would be based than they could based on a standard. Um, so that's always fun. Uh, where do we go? So that's kind of syntax. Uh, I also have a cheat sheet on the four most common comma conventions, introductory clauses, fanboys, lists, and uh, parentheticals or interjections. Um, and you can find those sorts of things all over the place, resources on those sorts of things. Um, but I also kind of tie formulas to it, try and communicate it uh, in a way that goes beyond um, kind of just the traditional humanities thing. So it, um, you can, if you're in one of my classes, you can find resources under files. If you're not in one of my classes, I guess you could try messaging me. Maybe I'll get a video up just to be, just to be thorough um, or if I'm bored. Um, but let's move on. Uh, we know that words are organized into structures more than just word order. That's syntax. So you can see here um, in this example, uh, we want to think about how phrases and chunks of words are put together, and that's syntax. Um, so those are fun and give us a place to start thinking. He, so as we think about these grammatical norms um, or these syntactic norms, um, we want to we can start thinking more, um, and more and more. And I've been trying to tie to this idea of context all along because the language and context is how meaning is made and how we know whether a piece of communication is effective is based on the context it's being directed into and the audience it's being directed toward. So we want to be aware of its context. And so with semantics and pragmatics, these semantics is directly linked to um, context. It's, um, it examines how meaning is encoded in the language and it's, it's not only concerned with the meaning of the individual words, but the levels of language. So we get things like denotation, connotation, and this idea of webs of meaning and how the words around this one word or the words around these phrases, how that web of language and that larger context can influence how, how readers or how speakers interpret words. Um, and so uh, some key concepts when we're thinking about semantics, uh, denotation, connotation, sense relationships between words, like antonyms, synonyms. Um, so it's all those those below the surface sometimes interrelationships between words. So when we talk about word families, there's a little bit of that there, that idea of webs of meaning. When we think about when I say um, cry by itself, it could have a couple different things. Paired with, um, it could mean tears, it could mean yell, it could mean battle, and so we might have a battle cry or we may, or we may be crying um, after the battle, if that makes sense. So um, these are just quick examples. Instant coffee here. Um, so, but we want to. But when with semantics, we're thinking about context and the web of words, sense relations. If you go on um, thesource.com, you can get a feel for this because you can type in the word um, and can see a lot of the associative terms. So actually, let's do that. This or us .com, and I'm probably going to pick just some random word or whatever I can come up with really fast. Um, so let's just do cry since that's the one I was doing. Um, so we can see the web of words around this. Bewailing, lamenting, sniveling, sobbing, whimpering, yowling, shedding tears, bawling. Um, we can also uh, look at, these are connected to weeping and making sad sounds. This is, then we can change it and say, look at the ones calling out or yelling, groan, grunt, outcry, roar, scream, call, cluck. Um, and then we've got call out or yell, advertise. Um, 
so like town crier style. Now, if we go in and we want to look at cry as chatter, like we want to replace synonyms and we go chatter, we can start getting a little bit of a different meaning and some of those things will overlap and some of them won't. But that's one way to look at word meaning based on its individual, more individual uh, words. Uh, we can also think of semantics as things in context that um, and the sense relations um, partially connected to context. For instance, I like to think of the example dog versus doll. Um, if I say the word, if I say something like uh, my dog's dirty and I'm at a vet or I'm at the pet store, you probably mean, you probably think I mean German Shepherd, Shih Tzu, Little Chihuahua, Yorkie Poo, something like that. Um, if I'm not that I do this, uh, not, um, but if you know, if a person's in a club and says my dog is dirty, um, and you look over and see that that person pointing at a forty-year-old man and a fourteen-year-old young woman, or vice versa, maybe uh, that means something different than it would uh, in the context of the vet or the pet store. You decide. Um, and if you're thinking, how did a 14-year-old get into a club? That's a good question. Moving on. This is language context semantics. Semantics. So when people people throw this out all the time, oh, that's just semantics. It's like semantics has to do with very specific word choice and how the context identifies the language. And so sometimes people will um, um, use these denotations and connotations um, to create ambiguity in the language. Okay, so semantics kind of links to language context or the webs of meaning and sense relationships. Um, if you get, if you're someone who who still struggles with denotation and connotation, think of the example I used with dog. If I'm talking about an actual dog, think D for denotation. A dog is a dog. Denotation. If I'm talking about a metaphorical comparison of some kind, uh, think connotation. Um, and that connote uh, kind of links to the French connaître, um, and there, there's this um, savoir versus connaître, and they have these two different meanings in French, um, which give us two different ways of thinking about knowing. If that resonates with you, cool. If not, ignore it. Um, but denotation is the physical, real, tangible. It's the real. It's the real meaning um, versus connotation, which is connected to the webs of meaning or alternate meanings or metaphorical meanings. Um, and so keep that in mind as you are thinking about semantics in stuff in context. Um, I kind of want to give pragmatics its own special thing. Three, two, one, go. All right, um, so with pragmatics, I'm going to try and just roll through this quickly. Pragmatics is the study of meaning in context. Um, it definitely ties with semantics. Here's the thing. Semantics is dealing with webs of words and context. Pragmatics is also pushing to how the practical use of language. So um, so sometimes I it may be confusing because semantics is built on context and so is pragmatics. Pragmatics is how do people practically use language in a particular social context, um, not what rules they're supposed to use, but how they practically use language. So if we look at the slide, it deals with particular utterances in particular situations and especially concerned with the various ways in which the many social contexts of language performance can influence interpretation. In other words, pragmatics is concerned with the way language is used to communicate rather than with the way language is internally structured. Um, and so, so there's the structure versus meaning situation going on, and there's also this rules for, and norms versus practical on the ground use. Um, and so when we think about, think about pragmatics, we want to think more about the practical use of language in a particular context. We traditionally think about error. So, uh, if you want to say something like in some, or you want to think about some phrase like "you don't know who you is," what does that mean? It can mean a lot of different things. If I say "you don't know who you is," and I follow it with a son, boy, whatever, um, that's kind of language I might hear growing up. You don't know who you is. Um, is it grammatically incorrect? Is it wrong? It's only wrong if enough people think it is, but the context and everyday use or practical use also helps us determine this. So if saying you don't know who you is is a really common saying 
where we're using it, um, it's perfectly fine and means something. Um, and it, or it has a very obvious meaning. Um, in some contexts, or the context, however, might change the meaning. So if you said, I'm not sure if it's grammatically correct or not, it kind of feels incorrect. What you're doing is you're drawing on traditional standard written English rules or academic language, academic writing rules, um, social norms, social conventions of language that say the is should be are. You don't know who you are. And you're making assumptions about the meaning of that phrase. If I'm trying to say um, I have someone, someone I'm talking to has an identity crisis, changing is to are makes sense. You don't know who you is, boy. Um, it's like figure out who you are, that kind of thing. Um, then maybe suggest if you're trying, if someone's like, how do I put this into academic writing? Maybe you suggest that adjustment. Maybe you don't because it's indicating a particular identity through the language. Or maybe it's wrong completely in the sense of we are thinking it's wrong in a wrong way. You don't know who you is if we wrote it out without and and the and we wanted to we could also suggest the edit for you don't know who you is that we put quotations around you um, the same way we would like a name or a word. You don't know who Bob is. You don't know who you is. So, for instance, um, this is something we'll see a lot of students um, do, especially in the first year of writing. Um, they're used to using you as kind of a, 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 a way of grabbing attention for the reader or as part of telling stories or giving directions. Um, we do this all the time. So, for instance, to get to my house, you go left at the stop sign and take a right past the squirrel and you jump over the rock and then you um, do a cartwheel and you'll be in my front yard. I used you a bunch there. I'm giving directions. I'm trying to orient my listener or my reader. Um, but when I use you, I'm usually in everyday context looking at the person and the context and my physical language or my physical communication body language is helping them understand that I'm talking to them. In an academic essay, if you use you, some instructors don't mind, some instructors think it's cool, especially person in personal writing. Um, if you're told, unless you're told it, it's what they want, it's it can set, I would discourage it because it can set up logical fallacies. And here's how, here's why. Um, if you are saying you, and you don't know who you is on the other side of the page, you don't know who your reader is that you're referring to as you, you can confuse it. Now, walk that back to the pragmatics discussion. Um, in some contexts, you don't know who you is, is a perfectly legitimate grammatical construction based on the social context and norms, and it means you have some sort of identity crisis. In another context, um, with quotation marks around you, um, it has a different meaning altogether, and if you don't know, if you don't see the quotation marks, you may, if you don't take a moment to ask about what the person's intention was or the context that they're speaking or writing into is, you may suggest an edit based on a, a sedimented Western uh, written English norm that sets them up to change meaning when they don't want to. You may, it, it may be, if you don't know whether they want to have, an, whether they're challenging someone's identity or whether they're um, trying to give practical um, feedback that someone doesn't know who a person they're referring to is in a piece of writing, um, then you give the wrong thing, the wrong advice based on a false grammatical norm that you're assuming, or a meaning you're assuming instead of having a conversation with the writer. We have to be careful with that. So we want to be, be aware of context and its ability to shape meaning. We want to be aware of the practical use of language in specific contexts that go that adjusts or help us helps us adjust language norms, sociocultural norms. So with that, we've now talked through a lot more, I think, than I want, meant to, but I think we made it through syntax, semantics, and pragmatics, if I'm remembering correctly. With that, I don't think I'm going to cover the rest of the things in the slide as cool as they can be. Um, they are very specialized, um, and so if you have individual questions, you can always uh, text me or um, message me through YouTube at that, or Canvas, depending on how you contact me. Um, I also have a Google Voice number. So, 
we're going to call that done for this first part of the components of language and the linguistic aspect of writing. Um, I still I will do videos on writing systems as well, but this is kind of where we're going to stop as far as this part of the video series goes. Cool. I hope you enjoyed that and have fun with it.